Hey, a portion of this episode is sponsored by the Beagle Camera. More on that later. Now, enjoy the show. Hey there, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be an interesting episode because this is my friend Eric. How's it going? How's it going, Eric? This is cool, right? This is great. Eric works for Moment, a really cool company making some incredible products. And the reason Eric is here is because they used 3D printing, a lot of it, to prototype the Lab 22 new stuff, like, uh, what is it, an iPad stand, an iPhone stand, and a headphone stand, right? Correct. So let's talk about the workflow of using 3D printing for practical uses, in this case, prototyping. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, well, first of all, Eric, what is Moment? We make gear and, and products for creative people, um, whether you're a filmmaker, a photographer, anything really. Um, you know, an artist at your desk, you wanna draw something up, we make that. Um, we also make a lot of things for make safe mounts, different things for your car, desk, basically anything you can think of. Creative people that have digital devices that they want to put to better use or maybe hold on better or use in a better way. Right. Okay. So Moment then worked with Sarah Dici, Dici as in Peachy, right. to make Lab 22. And I, I first heard about this, uh, I believe I saw it, uh, Sarah tweeted about it. So what is Lab 22? Yeah, so Lab 22 is is tech tools for humans. I think that's actually our exact... Uh, tech tools for humans. Tech tools Does it actually humans. say it on the box? <laughs> tech so, tools for humans, that's perfect. Yeah, we're trying to get the best the best tools on your desk to, to make you more productive. If that's you know the iPad stand that allows you to see your screen and allows you to draw on it. Um, you put it in the kitchen if you want to create in the kitchen. <laughs> you, know, you can put it anywhere in your house. Um, you know, we make a phone stand, we're gonna do a headphone stand, just all the tools that we feel like we can, you know, really impact at the desk kind of creative scene. Well, I think one of the reasons why this appealed to me, and I actually, I backed this Kickstarter, just so you know, I support you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, part of it was fantastic video you did, and Sarah, on Kickstarter with the, the launching this Lab 22. But I think one of the, one of the most coolest things I saw was the iPad stand. And I'd like to talk about that first because I got a glimpse as to the, the process, the iterative right. design you went through. So what you see in this video that they, they used to launch the Kickstarter, which has raised over $500,000, right. right? The iPad stand allows you to hold on to, well, in my case, a 12.9 inch iPad Pro, but at your desk, you can have it up or down or, or curved a little bit. It allows you to mount it in a way to make it easy to do your creation on it. Oh, look is, at that. This is still a uh, prototype phase. So, so this is keep this, that in mind. So this is still prototype right here. Right, this is pretty close to production. The big differences are we have it cut out because I was rebuilding some of the internals on it. This has come a long way since some of the stuff that I've seen. Absolutely. Uh, and it's. It's really nice because you, you just push it into a position you want, and then your, your surface, in this case an iPad, is available to be used in a creative purpose. Right. And uh, obviously this, is, this isn't the first design. No. This is not the first design. <laughs> no. So let's, here, what I wanna do, I just wanna set this aside for now. Okay. How did you start designing this iPad stand? What was the first part? So, so everything starts in SolidWorks. We use SolidWorks for, for all of our 3D design. Uh, well, most of it, um, and, and we, we just start mocking up, you know, what do we want it to look like? What do we want it to feel like? And we, we just put together a lot of different uh, different paths for that. That's our, our designer, Jordan, goes through all of that. And he, different paths, what do you mean? Well, do we want it to, to have, you know, this, this lip on the bottom? Do we want it to, how do we want it to move? How do we want it to look? How do we want it to feel? How do we want the person to interact with it? Oh, well, meaning that you do have some initial, like, sketches or drawings Absolutely. or some, um, some requirements for the product itself. Right, yeah, okay. we, have, we have a list of what we, what we think we want it to do, and then we, we go about, and, and he'll go through and try to figure out how does that, how does that work, how does that feel, like what, what, do, what do we want it to do, what are our ideal situations? And he'll come up with you know, five or six different, different categories, different ways to do that, and different looks for it. And then from this that- This is all still digital within SolidWorks. All still digital, yeah, and he'll start honing that in um, and at the same time, I'll take those ideas and say, okay, well, like, if you want the mechanism to rotate in these different directions, what are the mechanics of making that actually work? Like, Because in the end, it's cool if it does all those things, but it actually has to function too. Well, you come from a product, like a design and manufacturing side right. of things. So yep. uh, as anybody knows, uh, we have design for 3D printing, where if you model something that looks really cool and you want to 3D print it, you still have to take into consideration 
the manufacturing method that's going to bring it to life. So same thing Absolutely. with any product design, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's kind of funny because with when we're when we're starting to mock up these things, we'll start to print them out. You know, we'll either do really rough FDM prints or do a little bit higher quality prints like we have here. Well, let's bring those out actually yeah. while you're talking about them. Um, and so it's funny because you know we we're thinking about the design and what what will finally be the manufacturing method, but we also in that process have to plan around how we're going to prototype it. Okay. Um, like you'll see with with MJF, this is all multi jet fusion printing on the HP printers. The wall thickness is really critical, like um, I, almost like an injection molded part. Um, whereas with FDM, you can make the wall thickness whatever you want. It doesn't. You get away work. with some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can build, yeah, with, with, with injection molding, you can't really do that. The wall thickness has to be pretty consistent. Sure. You have to transition correctly. Um, you have to put in ribs. And so MJF works a lot of the same ways um, as injection molding. So you'll see like this cutout on the back of this this, this arm. Um, that's not It's a prototype. Long. It's actually hollowed out in there. And part of that was to make it easier to clean out. Part of that was also just because um, we have to have the thin walls, you know, which wouldn't be there on the final part in aluminum. Um, but for, for printing, we have to put that in because oh, otherwise we'd, we'd get a lot of sink. Like you can actually see on, on this part, it has some like sink and just defects in Whoa. it because we have thick sections and thin sections. So, so this is because it was too thin? Uh, it was too thick transitioning to too thin. So it, <laughs> it'll, it'll hold heat differently, like an injection molded part, and it'll start to shrink. Um, whereas Jeez. the thin walls can't, can't take it as much. Now, one of the things you showed me before we started filming here was that there was a, a mechanism yep. uh, for the iPad stand. And uh, what I showed, what you showed me in the metal was a little bit newer, but originally there was, this is a lever system, right? Yeah, so this this used, originally the thought was we wanted to lock the pad, the stand into three or four different positions and different rotations at the top. Okay. Um, just to, to lock it into a place. Um, so what we had is this lever design instead of the extra cable here, but this <laughs> lever releases it and it actually moves, there's a cable that runs all through to the bottom and then it runs through a mechanism at the top as well. And it allows you to change the position based on where it, where you want it. Um, and it and it locks into certain positions right. along the, the, whatever the radius is yep. or the, the circumference of the, right. the thing. So, um, you know, we, we went through this whole process. This is, was, you know, months of work to try and get it all sorted out Look and route the cables. Um, you can see. That's really cool. I would imagine this is a bear to manufacture right here. Yeah, it was not, it was not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can see the different cable paths are in there um, and the cables run all through it. Um, there's two cables and it was, it was cool. It was, it was good, but it, we even made some metal prototypes of it. So you can kind of see the process here. We went from plastic to metal parts. Oh, um, so this was a design that was going to like th that went further within the iterative iterative yeah, process. Yeah, we got we got here and we said this is this is pretty good based on what we've seen here. We think we can take this further, so we did, and it, it just completely it was it was not good. <laughs> it's just <laughs> really bad. It was really hard to manufacture, and and it could be done, but the amount of time that we'd have to put into it to make it. To make it that's affordable. That's a lot of pieces right there. <laughs> right, that's a lot of parts. <laughs> and the, the time we had to put in to make it affordable and make it actually work, was it's just not worth it. You know, yes, we could do it. You know, NASA makes rockets that are really complicated and really cool, but they can really put 30 years into making it really cool. And we just don't have that. Um, well, so. no, well, let me ask you this, because 3D printing as a method of prototyping obviously led you to this place, but, mm -hmm. but now I, I'm not a product designer, so how come you couldn't glean from this 3D print that manufacturing would have been this difficult. I mean, we could, and we knew it would be, have its challenges for sure, but we just didn't know quite what the challenges would be just because when you, when you transition to actually machining something, um, you know, you have to really start to look at, you know, any, anybody who has an MJF printer can print these parts. Okay. Pretty much. Anybody who has a CNC machine can't necessarily make these parts because it's, it's more difficult to get the fixturing and the tooling right. Like, what are their expertises? Can like this this part had and and at this stage we knew we weren't going to go with this, but it had a real really cool profile around the outside of this, which was just not really going to be an inexpensive part. To <laughs> so make. like right around here, there was going to really cool that profile is going to cost an extra twenty bucks or something sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Wow. Basically, yeah. Okay. It's like, well, okay, how much does the user value that? And <laughs> do we really push for it? And a lot of manufacturers would just 
not have a good process in place to do that because it's not something that they really want to do. So, you know, it's tailoring that to the factory is, is big. And even, even once we came up to the final design and sent it over to our factory, they'll still take it and pick it apart and say, well, we're going to do these things. We're not going to do these things. We'll do this this way, but we're not going to do it your way. And you know, it's kind of a negotiation at that point. Like oh. we have a final design, but now we have to make sure that our final design matches what they are capable of doing or willing to do and then put it all together into a product. Oh, so you, so as a, in, in product design, you have the ability to get to a final design that then can still change depending on what the manufacturer is able to do. Absolutely. So then does your final become a new final or is this like final design and then you have final manufacturing? Are there, is that, is that how you kind yeah, of Yeah, there's different stages things? of that, yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, you go into it knowing a manufacturer and thinking you know what they're gonna do and they'll just go like completely in the other direction. Like, well, I didn't see that at all. Um, and sometimes, you know, they do something that surprises you and it's like, hey, that's actually really good. <laughs> like what well, you that did makes there. sense. Well, then, I, I, I would imagine as you get more uh, confident within the product design and you work with the manufacturer multiple times, you have an idea of what they can do. Right. And so you, you don't, the more you work together with a manufacturer, my guess is the less times you run into a surprise. Absolutely. Okay. And, and the, more, the more iterations we make of this, the more times I build this before getting to the actual manufacturer gives us more confidence to go back to the manufacturer when they say, we can't do this. We say, actually, you can. This is how you do it. So we, we were using a prototype manufacturer for a lot of these stands. And we probably made, I think, 15 different stands over, over the last year and a half. <laughs> um, you know, not everyone was of this design, but when we finally got to this design, you know, I was assembling in my, my office, I can go to the manufacturer and they can say, hey, this can't work. It just can't work. It's just not going to work. And I'll say, well, try this. This is what we did to overcome those same problems. And then they'll be able to go back and say, okay, yeah, either we can do that or what if we do what you're saying this way? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of, it's, it's a negotiation. But that's really interesting to know because uh, as, as someone with a print farm that I, you know, I understand the need to have something printable and someone will come to you with a design and then uh, you, you can say, this is cool, but if this is changed and this is changed, you know, less material takes less time, uh, it's easier to make, less chance of failure, that sort of thing. Right. And so, so that comes into play even, even for the, yep. <laughs> <laughs> the pros like yourself. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, Eric, because this is staggering to me, like the, you still call this a prototype. Mm -hmm. It's pretty close though, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is a prototype, and this was a prototype. How did you how did how did you get from this, scrap it, and then say, okay, let's do this? What what was what happened there? <laughs> yeah. So, the big the big change between here and here is that we realized that we wanted to go nice, to dude. yeah we wanted to go to like an infinite hinge um, where you can put it anywhere you want, and we wanted to be able to make it simpler. Like that was a big thing was reducing parts, reducing the complexity of this. That's a lot of parts right there. It's a lot of parts. This seems like fewer parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's about, I don't know, probably less than a third the parts. Jeez. <laughs> um, but some of the parts that are in here are actually in this pile of things. Um, and the final well, I know That platforms. looks, so, so this right here. Right. That looks like a piece that was in there. Like, yeah, the, like the, the, the bracket. Yeah, just a simpler version of it. Um, but it's, it's definitely here. Um, and, you know, in, in the old days, you'd be able to go over and start just going to the factories and asking what parts they have. Um, but with COVID, you can't really do that anymore. No. Um, so I, I got online and, and found, tracked down some manufacturers and friction hinges, which are just hinges that are pre-made. You know, it's an off the shelf part. You can go and you can say, okay, I want this hinge. And there's customization you can do. You can customize the, the different thicknesses and the, the spacing for the mounts. And you can customize the, the actual friction in the hinge. Uh, but you can get these parts, and then you can just start integrating them into the design. So that's where you see, um, I had it. Some, oh, here's one of the actual hinges here. Oh, there we go. Um, and even that. This is an infinite hinge right here. Yes. Yeah, and even that took some iteration. Like the first version of the hinge we used only had two mounting bolts, because uh, this is the version that they offer off the shelf. Most of the companies this hinge manufacturer works with, they work on things like laptops and laptop. Uh, screens. Oh, which and, are infinite hinges. Right, right. And so um, a lot of them are supported in different ways than what we're supporting here as far as the, the mechanical part of it. So I made it, didn't have a lot of confidence in it. Um, so we ended up going with a, a two bolt mounting system. 
And so that's one of the ways that, you know, even with an off the shelf part, we're still prototyping and we're still working with a, a supplier to try and get it just right. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I love how though everything started with a SolidWorks model and being able to 3D print, even with probably, you said you have an Ender 3 at home, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, even, even that is allowing you to do the prototype for a product Absolutely. such as this. It yep. has to start somewhere. But I mean, even even before we get to printing, sometimes we'll even just take like these, amount them to a couple blocks of wood, hang weights from them, and just say, "Hey, is this hinge what we think it is? Is this physically strong enough?" And then we'll move to like pretty rough, but FDM parts. We'll print them, um, you know, to check fit and things like that. And then we'll start moving on to the MJF, where we're starting to get more uh, higher quality, more durable parts that we can actually count on as far as like dimensional accuracy and things like that. Right, I would imagine that plays a huge role in being able to prototype things, is the, is the dimensional accuracy right. of the parts and being able to, to work together. Because I mean, once you get to MJF, uh, you're, you're closer, you're, you're, you're almost to the metal. Right, well and the MJF is so nice because it, it gives us a really durable part, but like these parts here, this takes a couple of days to get back from a printer, and we use a printer in the US. Um, this takes a couple of days, this takes, four or five weeks plus <laughs> shipping. So, and it's significantly more. This is probably 10 times the cost of what this is. So we can move really fast through these prototypes and just say to like, you know, does this idea work? Is it even remotely good? Can you make MJF products? Yes, we actually do. Oh. Yeah, so we have um, the, the interfaces for our phone cases. Oh, well here, let's move this aside. Okay, yeah. so Moment isn't just Lab 22. Well, all of the Lab 22 stuff is cool, and you know, I, I can't wait to get my version of this. <laughs> yeah. The Beagle camera in this box is a great addition to your 3D printer. Inside the box, you'll find this, the Beagle camera. This is the brains of the operation right here, and it looks cute. And wires, these allow the Beagle to connect to your 3D printer and connect it to a wall socket or a USB source for power. With the Beagle out of the box, go grab yourself a 3D printer. Whoa. I'm gonna use this one. Connect one cable to the machine, just like that, and the other cable to a USB power source. It comes with a power brick if you wanna plug it into the wall, otherwise find yourself a USB power source. I needed a stand for my VR device and I had this going and I thought, let's see what the Beagle can do. Assembly was simple, and now I've got a place to rest my VR. The Beagle is great for those that want remote control of their 3D printer, they want the automation of time-lapse recording, they want the ability to send G-codes from multiple devices, and they want the ability to manage the printer while not around it. There's a link in the description where you can get your own Beagle, and I just wanna say thank you very much for sponsoring this part of the episode. Now, the rest of the show. You also do other products, like right. Moment has product. Yep, yeah, these are phone cases we make. This is the iPhone 14. These are early samples of it. Ooh. Um, so these are injection molded cases from our supplier. Um, and then these interfaces go and it in. says it's, it's, so it's TPU plus PC. So it, it, is, a, it is a TPU plus polycarbonate yep. mix. Yeah, okay. so this, there's the outside is TPU. Under this microfiber, there's a, a sheet of PC, which gives us, um, rigidity in it. There's also magnets in here. Like on these ones, you can actually see the MagSafe ring because these are early samples. Oh, look at that. Um, but our our interface mount, which we mount our lenses to, um, it snaps in and you can actually see the PC layer coming through oh, here. Oh, you can, yeah. Yeah, we get our data at the same time that, that you get your data. <laughs> um, and that's when the phones are launched. When Apple actually starts <laughs> shipping phones, yeah. Yeah. we can go and we can get them, we buy them. And then we put them in our cases and say, hey, this is good, it works, or hey, this is gonna need some tweaking, um, which is always fun once you've opened tooling, because a tooling on a phone case like this can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of money. So with the 3D printed interfaces, it allows us not only to prototype ahead of time and say, hey, this fits the case, this looks good, um, but it also allows us on day one of getting phones to check the lenses and make sure they work before we open tooling on these parts. So. We've already shipped a few thousand of these. Well, many thousands, tens of thousands almost at this point. <laughs> um, but we use these initially to, to start shipping to customers so that customers can have the cases early because we have the cases already. The case, the case data that we, we, we get some leaked data as well. Um, Everybody gets leaked data yeah. in, uh, on the manufacturing side of things, I would imagine, in some form or another. Right, and so that's a lot safer than the camera data, because even really? the leaked models never have data on the cameras. Like this year, oh. they switched the, the focal distance from 26 millimeters to 24. 
that wouldn't come through on a CAD model. No, it wouldn't. And so that's the only kind of thing you can test in person. So having these on day one to do that, you know, if, if we'd have made a bunch and they didn't work, we're not only out tooling, we're out customer time and we're out, you know, all the products we've already made, which is just a waste. So by printing these, we can, we can verify on day one, then turn on production manufacturing of them using this. You know, we can print tens of thousands of these pretty oh. fast, sh ship them to customers. These aren't as durable as the injection molded parts, although we do have customers that use them for a couple of years. But depending on your use, they may not last that long. Um, but it also, it just allows people to get cases in hand faster. Otherwise, they'd be sitting, we'd have you know, yeah. hundreds of thousands of cases in our warehouse just sitting there waiting because it takes time to open tooling. It takes about a month to open tooling and it takes about two weeks to actually make them and ship them to us. But with this though, uh, it, it's crazy because like you said, the cases are injection molded and it's because you do get some leaked data. And if you were to include these in the case, then you'd be late to market be by a long, long, months. long time. And that's what we've done in the past. And But having the snap fit idea, really, I love that you're utilizing the like a this side of additive to yep. create a piece of the product that you can once verified ship to the consumer. And so they get their case, they can protect their new phone. And then not long after you're able to verify this, they snap it in and they're good to go. Yep, absolutely. That's so cool. Yeah, it's been it's been game changing for us because, you know, it used to take us until January or February to ship cases, which was just that's a long time in, in phones. That's long time forever. Man. You might as well not do it at that point. That's, you know? a, that's almost to the, the S model of the iPhone, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the cool things, and Eric just told me about this, is the the iPad stand here. It's user serviceable. You can remove these plates to get to the hinges, right? Right. Yeah. The whole idea is that if you have an issue with it, we can we can fix it without just throwing it away, which is handy. <laughs> it's good for the environment. Good for everybody, really. Well, but I, I really love that in a product design. I, I, I bet you do as well. But being able to repair something you've purchased. I know there's all this, you know, the right to repair stuff. But, right. but beyond even that, just taking repair into the design. Yeah, so just taking off that panel. So wait, so look at that. So that's the hinge right there. Yep, you can take these two screws out. Take the, you have to kind of rotate yeah, go around for it. to get these screws. Oh, look at that. And the whole thing just comes apart. Oh, that's cool. We don't have to take it apart to, to see though, but that's handy that uh, something like this, an elegantly designed something, actually takes the, the repair of the things into consideration in the product right. design. Because I mean, two screws to hold a little door or a little plate on gives you full access. Right. That's great. It's not like, there are certain machines that I have that are 3D printers that to get to this part, you have to completely disassemble the machine until right. you get to that part. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, I mean, this isn't as complex, but at the same time, it's very useful having this in the product design. Right, yeah, and it's a challenge to try and... And I'll put it back together. Yeah, right? go for it. Um, it's a challenge to try and, you know, find a, find a design that looks good and is repairable, but it's a good... Oh, it's backwards. It is backwards, isn't it? It's a good exercise just from a, you know, less waste standpoint. And, you know, making your products last longer is always good. Um, but it's just cool to be able to do, I think. Well, and this offers the ability to upgrade as well. If for some reason a new hinge design comes out that fits in the old space, yep. people can just swap it in. Or uh, a new uh, iPad with a larger screen. You know, there, there's rumors that we might see a larger iPad. Or if a new, a new version of the same iPad comes out that has, so far we've been lucky that um, most of the iPads going back are still compatible with the new stuff. They just keep adding more magnets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like this is an iPad uh, Air, or this is iPad Pro version three. Oh, well, here, let's see. So it goes, wait, did I get that right? Yep. Uh, yeah, okay. So like that, and then it can bend and move. So the idea being what's shown in the Kickstarter video is having it down here, right? Someone's actually on a desk. Right. But yep. then being able to bring it up. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this one, the magnets aren't quite right on this one, but also so that, you like you said, it's still a prototype. Spin it this way. Oh, <laughs> yes. There it is. I see. Boy, the magnets aren't as strong as this no, one. No, right? this one has a, it's prototyping. And so this is actually, this doesn't click into place. This is a very, it's an infinitely it, adjustable hinge. Infinitely adjustable. So you can, you can have it exactly how you want it. If you're getting, if like you're using an Apple pencil to yep. get it in there. Yeah. One of the ideas is that, you know, it, it can set it on your desk and your desk is probably 
flat and level. Probably. But you can also set we'll a see. coffee shop, and you can have this in your lap somehow, or you could have it on the chair edge. So you might want to have it in those weird positions. That makes sense. Oh, I like this. This is cool. The goal is to be able to pick this up from the magnets, right? Yeah, and it, it will be, definitely. Okay. Well, that's the test. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Hey, uh, guys. How, how did you and Moment get together to make Lab 22? Mm. Oh my goodness, big question. So uh, I'm sure Eric already let you know, it was a journey, it was probably like a year and a half, almost yeah. two years from start to finish, but really it, it started with, okay, iPad stand. I am obsessed with my iPad, but it kind of always awkwardly fits into my workflow. And I'm obsessed with my desk and you know the tech on it. And I always was struggling with just the keyboard setup and basically treating an iPad as a laptop, but not a laptop. And I was like, I need a stand that can be versatile. It can sit next to my computer. Um, but more importantly, it can come down to a position where I can actually use it as an iPad. I can use my Apple Pencil. I can touch the iPad, you know? And so it really just started with the iPad stand and kind of my list of things that I need, right? Um, but then it's like, okay, it has to look nice, right? And that's where Jordan came in. And then it has to actually be functional. That's where Eric came in. So um, it, you know, it was something that I had never done before, made proper hardware, which I'm kind of like wearing the right shirt for this, <laughs> the hardware Microsoft collection here. Um, you know, I knew Moment had those connections, not just with the factory, but they understand the process of what it's like to making hardware. Um, and I kind of knew the direction I wanted the brand to go in. So I thought it would be like, you know, the perfect, perfect partnership in ways. And, and it's been, it's been super crazy to see now the feedback after working on it, you know, heads down, you know, one meeting a week for so long. I've seen a lot of the prototypes actually, Eric brought them over. And I'm really curious because obviously we were talking about 3D printing and how that it, that helped with the iterative process. Were you ever shipped any 3D printed parts to actually take a look and try out? Yes, and it was so funny because the first 3D printed prototype I got was a headphone stand and it just like, it was like snapped upon arrival. <laughs> I was like, am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do with this? Am I supposed to like glue it back together? And I, I can't remember if it was you, Eric, or someone else, but they're like, oh yeah, it's not supposed to be like that. Um, that, that you know, happened in shipping. But um, so yeah, it was, it was fun to kind of get those initial prototypes to see it in real life. But yeah, there, there were some things that you have to worry about when you're doing a 3D print versus an actual prototype that, you know, is metal or aluminum, because obviously it's not as substantial, but it was cool to see that, you know, in 3D for the, for the first time, it helps you visualize it and it helps you even say, oh, this might be a little bit too tall. Um, I think that was one of the things with a couple of the stands for the headphone stand and phone stand was kind of figuring out that height. And even with the phone stand, um, you know, a few people are like, ah, oh, it seems too, too tall. But in, in practice, when I was using the prototypes, I, I like it almost being, it's not eye level, that would be so insanely tall, but it's so easy to kind of just like make that direct, you know, line of contact text. Um, I kind of like it being up high. I use it when I eat lunch, you know, I'll just throw a YouTube video on and, and it's, nice and whatever that that's not the 3d prototype that would be crazy to have a 3d prototype with magsafe i don't even know if that's possible is it possible yeah all right it's possible yeah. there you I go just, I just next iteration yeah. <laughs> did you ever uh in, in this process of product design and being you know part of the iterative way of, of doing it did you ever have an aha moment like did you get a certain prototype like prototype 5x or 10y or whatever your naming convention is did you ever have something and be like whoa like this is it I mean, I think with the, the iPad stands, since those, like with the suite of products, um, you know, the team at Moment kind of helped me make that come to life. But for me, I've always been just like super zoned in on the iPad stand because I just so desperately have needed this product, right? So I feel like from the first prototype of the iPad stand, obviously, um, you know, you can't 
3D print that because it's a little bit more complex. Or maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you guys talked about that. But um, from the first prototype that I got of the iPad stand, and I still have it, I think this is actually the first prototype um, that we made. So as you can see, it's a little banged up and stuff, but I'm still using it right now as our <laughs> better samples or with our designer Jordan. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Obviously there were some issues, like, you know, the strength of the hinges could be stronger and it was kind of like falling down over time. But for me, it just seems like there's so many parts working to see that in real life, just from the first prototype, I was like, whoa, this is real, this is crazy, you know? And you're using it, like you're using it right there. Yeah. You just showed me. It's a prototype oh, that it, you're still able exactly. to like, yeah. Exactly, and you know, with it being the first one, it's kind of crazy and it, it's still working great. Obviously it doesn't um, look the best because it has been transported to so many places and banged up and the paint wasn't final and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, the fact that, you know, I'm still using it right now and I'm so used to digital products and making videos, I'm not, you know, I'm like, it's cool to just see it on my desk and be like, damn, we made this guys. <laughs> you know, okay, well then uh, one last question for you because I know we got stuff yeah. to do. Uh, just with what you said right there, like, wow, this is cool, it's on my desk, I can see it. Uh, you know, the audience is hungry to see more people get into 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And so the question to you, Sarah, is if we were to find you a really good 3D printer, do you think we could get you involved? Oh, 100%. And you should come to Texas. And we do like a proper collab. That's actually <laughs> the, the, just so you know, the, uh, the, the printer we have in mind is uh, actually has a warehouse in Texas. So I think it's perfect marriage oh right there. Oh, instantly video. Yeah, deal. let's combine brains and we can come up with a snappy thumbnail and title for, for my channel. That would be so cool. Uh, I tell you what, yeah, I will, I'll reach out via email because I'll get a plan in motion and we will get you a really cool 3D printer. Epic. Eric, we've actually talked about a lot of really cool stuff. And uh, for the audience out there, we brought them through how 3D printing can be used to bring mass market products to life. If they wanna know anything more about Moment or Lab 22 or the Kickstarter that just happened, uh, look at them right there and let them know where they can go. Yeah, you can check out all the products on shopmoment.com and uh, reach out to us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the things. <laughs> That's great. All the things. All the things. All of them. <laughs> yeah, shop Moment on everything, huh? Shopmoment.com. One final thing though, obviously, uh, we might work together on a collaboration in the future, but more importantly, we have to close this out. And thankfully, we actually talked to Sarah about that. So Sarah, close us out. Okay, everyone, like always, hug each other more, and hey, high five.